My name is Angel Rappi, and I am part of the Geographical Interest Group, which is the South Bay Group for ASDB. So a little bit of a background. There, there is, we are part of a bigger chapter in San Francisco called the Golden Gate chapter of ASDB. And we have geographical groups around the, around the Bay Area. Some, one in the North Bay and one here. I'm not sure if we have one in the East Bay currently. But once you become a member of the Golden Gate chapter, you're invited to any of the geographical interest group for free. So that's one of the benefits. I am just curious, how many of you here are non-members? You could just kind of raise your hand. Yes, non-members. So not, you're not a member of the Golden Gate chapter. Okay, so we've got quite a few that are non-members. And how many of you here are members? <laughs> Wonderful. Great. And if for you who are non-members, if you are curious about uh, membership, please turn to the person who's a member and ask them about it. <laughs> you know what their experience is. And if you don't get a chance to ask them about it, ask me about it at the end. Okay, so we'll, I'll talk to you about because I've already had some people ask me what does it take to be a member and how do I become a member, so I can, I can show you how to do that. Also, we have a few people here who are part of the geographical interest group of the South Bay, and I know Paul back there is, 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 Paul is leading this group, and we have a few other people. Can you just raise your hand? Okay, great. Thank you very much. And this... There, it, takes, it takes a lot of time and effort to put these meetings together, so I really want to thank them for, for their you know, just stepping up and volunteering. During the, the meeting, please feel free to, and I'm sure Rick will, won't mind, um, to get up and get food if you wish, okay? Because we always end up bringing home a lot of food extra. We don't want to do that anymore. So get some food and feel free to get up at any time. Before, before I am, um, during the during the presentation. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rick. And um, Rick DeMarco is actually a strategic business leader with a proven track record of motivating and inspiring people to achieve exceptional results in in environments that that are changing. He's actually held several senior leadership roles and um, in different industries, in companies like Carrier, KitchenAid, I don't know how many of you have KitchenAids in your home, um, and HB, how many of you have heard of that company? Okay. And, he's, and, and in HB, he was actually in marketing uh, and general management, sales, human resources and accounting. He actually has a CPA background. He is a leader and expert in the emerging field of inter, um, internal brand alignment and employee engagement. And so that's one of the reasons why he's here today. And he recently led those efforts at HP, um, which he calls the largest technology company in the world. Are we still there? Are you still, is it still the largest? Largest oh, revenue. Okay. Place. Um, in addition to his technical skills and experience in B2B, B2C, small companies, large companies, and product service companies, Rick is an expert in leadership effectiveness and team dynamics. He co-founded a leadership consulting company along with noted leadership expert Mike Sanglateri. Any of you know who Mike is? Well, well, Mike used to be a formal all-pro <laughs> middle uh, linebacker uh, with the Chicago Bears and the NFL Hall of uh, Famer. Now, Rick holds the position of Managing Director, West Coast, for Inward Strategic Consulting, which is the company that he's representing today. He's a pioneer and a thought leader in the field of employee brand engagement and internal alignment. He has a passion for leveraging the power of employees to deliver the brand promise and business strategy to the market. And his unique multidisciplinary background positions um, has led him to develop strategies 
and plans that are relevant to all the functional area of an organization. So very impressive background. But I asked him, what is it that nobody knows about you? And he said, <clears throat> he actually uh, is a voice major. He has a voice major, a two-week voice major, two weeks. right? <laughs> a two-week voice major. So I asked him if he would sing for us tonight, but he can stir down and request. So I'd like Rick to start. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do this without a mic. Hopefully, it's not a problem. Can you everyone hear me in the back? Okay, be a little less, a little easier not to use the mic. So I'm excited to be here. I appreciate all of you being here tonight. Um, I would tell you that um, how many of you know something about gamification? Okay, so a lot of you, it's a relatively new topic. Okay. Um, when Angel went through my background, I would tell you that um, when a recruiter looked at my resume, they would say, why would you ever hire this guy? <laughs> you know, what was he thinking? I was a CPA. I went through marketing. But I've always had a passion. I always believed when I was younger that if you could learn how to motivate and inspire people, you could do it in any company, in any industry, in any function. So I moved from an accountant to running a cable TV operation, to doing KitchenAid, to doing Whirlpool, to co-founding and leadership consulting. The common thread to all of that is I always had a passion for the power of employees and delivering on a business strategy. Um, the thing that's interesting to me is back then it was just a belief system I had, but I had no empirical evidence to show that it really made a difference. Now there's evidence from Gallup, from Conference Board, from Towers Watson. Every time you pick up a publication, there's empirical evidence that will say when you can inspire and engage your workforce, it has a direct relationship to the performance metrics of your organization. It's been tied to higher profitability, uh, lower turnover, higher productivity, um, no matter what dimension you look at. So it's really exciting to me because being an accountant and a marketer, I'm a little bit of a Frankenstein. I've got that left brain and right brain thought mentality. And for the longest time, I couldn't get the left brain people to really see the power of their employees in that strategy. But now, no matter what function you're in, it's becoming more and more evident that it's really critical that you get your employees engaged. So, um, so that kind of drove me through my whole career. And um, so I want to do a couple things tonight. I want to, first of all, give you a little bit of a background on Inward and why we're even qualified to talk about this. Because anytime I listen to somebody talk, the first question I have is what makes them, why should I even listen to what they have to say? So I want to give you the foundation for inward strategic consulting and why we're qualified to talk about gamification. Then we'll get into gamification itself. And then I'm going to share some case studies of actual gamified approaches that are going on today. One of the biggest ones is um, we're doing some work right now with McDonald's. And I'm really excited about the program that we put together with them. It won't launch until September. So I'm going to give you a preview of it tonight. Um, we also are working with Walmart, but I, I really couldn't present that yet because that hasn't launched yet as well. But, um, and then I'll show you a couple other examples of gamified approaches and, and the impact that they can have. So should be a little bit of something for everyone. OK, um, so a little bit about internal about Inward Strategic Consulting. We're an employee brand engagement and communications consulting firm. That's what we do. So we work with clients like Walmart, HP, Zurich Financial, uh, McDonald's to align the behaviors and attitudes of employees so that they deliver exceptional customer experiences. So, so that's really the connection point. When you would talk about employee engagement, the obvious answer would be, so what? You know, what's the payoff? Well, again, there's a direct connection to customer loyalty, customer engagement, to your employee engagement. A um, couple examples. Have any of you ever rented a car from Enterprise? Mm -hmm. It's a whole different feel than when you rent from one of the other major car rental companies. You know, someone walks you out to the car. They make sure you know how the car operates. They give you water. They give you water. <laughs> um, you fly Southwest Airlines. They seem like they enjoy what they're doing. You know, so companies that get it right, Zappos, um, they created a culture where people enjoy what they're doing, they're engaged. And when they do that, it directly reflects in the way they deal with customers. So 
that's what we do. We, we have proprietary processes and approaches to build not only strategizing, but building plans that we execute um, to build exceptional internal cultures. I would tell you that um, when I worked at HP, I realized at some point that I needed a little external help. So I wanted a mission to find companies that said they did this kind of work. And a lot of companies claim to work on internal brand alignment and employee engagement. But when you really started sorting through, there were only a handful that really focused on just that area. You know, others would work more on external branding, and as a sideline, they'd look at the internal side. Um, Inward was one of the few that I came across when I was at HP that I was impressed with the way they approached this. So I hired them to help me, and when I left HP, I liked what they did so much, I joined them. So um, they really do have an interesting approach. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary recognized as experts and pioneers in the field. Our CEO was recognized as one of the top 25 consultants in the country last year. Uh, and we're a relatively small company. But we're just passionate about the internal side of alignment. We like to look at, we bridge the gap between ad agencies and strategy consultants. Because I've worked with a lot of consultants that tend to come in and be real directive. They want to tell you what your strategy should be or, or how you should execute it. Um, we really come alongside of our clients and work in a collaborative fashion, meet them where they're at, and as opposed to being direct and build consensus. We build, but you know, y'all know that when someone's involved in building something, they're much more engaged in executing it. So our whole approach is get people engaged in building a strategy, in building tactical plans, and they're much more likely to buy into it when you're ready to, to deliver. Um, we have full creative confidence. We have a full studio that's based in Bentonville because we're the agency of record for Walmart. So we built a studio there with full creative confidence. So not only can we develop strategy, but we can execute it. And uh, our corporate office is in Boston. Like I said, we've got an office in Bentonville. Um, I'm here on the West Coast, and we have a full research capability that's in Orlando. So as I mentioned earlier, we really do take an internal buy-in, facilitative approach to working with clients and building a total engagement plan. We believe that companies and organizations have to inform, inspire, empower, and engage their people to support the brand. And I'll share a little bit of that process with you in just a minute. But basically, um, you have to educate employees to what your vision and strategy and direction really is. And it's amazing how many companies keep that a secret. You know, but if they don't know where you're going, then they don't know what kind of time you're making to get there, right? So you gotta educate them. But the second phase to that is they have to believe it. They have to believe that you really can deliver that strategy. And they have to see how what they do contributes to the success of the company. So there's gotta be a relevancy factor. They have to really, you know, we used to do at HP, we do an annual Voice of the Workforce survey. It's one thing to ask somebody, do you know what the brand positioning is? It's quite another to ask if they can explain it to somebody, and if they really understand what we're trying to accomplish. From there, you have to give them the tools and, and techniques to be able to deliver on the brand promise and deliver on the strategy. So you've got to move them from knowledge to understanding relevance to empowering them and being committed to deliver on it. And then finally, you have to reinforce their behavior. You have to engage them. So I'll show you in a little more detail in just a minute, but if you don't align all your HR processes around the behavior you're trying to change, why in the world would I change my behavior? And oftentimes you'll lay out behavioral attributes for an employee, but the promotion, the way you promote, the way you reward and recognize, the way you hire isn't aligned with your strategy and your position. So it's critical that you walk employees through this cycle of educating them, inspiring them, empowering them, engaging them. And I would tell you, it doesn't happen in the natural. It, it really requires collaboration across functions and across organizational structure. Because what will happen, you know, one of the, the key constituencies that have to work together on engagement is HR, communications, marketing, learning, and development. If those aren't aligned, it's hard for an employee to have a consistent experience. So what happens is in each of those organizations, they have their own goals and objectives that they're driving and alignment just does not happen in the natural. So it really takes a commitment and a conscious effort to bring the right cross-functional team together if you're going to inspire and engage your employees. So I'm not going to go through the, 
I don't want everybody's eyes to roll in the back of their head. There's a lot of stuff up here. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but I'm sharing this process only because when we get to talking about gamification, the key point I want to start with is gamification is one tool or technique that's part of an overall comprehensive strategy for employee engagement. It's not an end within itself. So it's an element in the whole process that I just started to lay out. So let me go through this relatively quickly, but this is kind of the foundational process that we would use when you look at a comprehensive employee engagement program. And then I'll come back to this and show you where gamification fits into that process. Um, there's four different hierarchies here that I want to quickly scan. The first one we call the hierarchy of effects, which I've just talked about. It's moving employees through that cycle of knowledge to understanding and relevance to commitment to reinforcing behavior. And you really need to walk them through all that cycle. And it's a continual cycle. It never stops. It's not an event. It's a process. From there, you look at your communication hierarchy. There are effective ways to communicate for each stage of that cycle for employees. Company-wide communication, you can't just throw out an email and think that you're going to change behavior. And at the same token, you can't go down here by throw out a reward and recognition program and think that's going to educate them on the vision. So this hierarchy funnel is aligned with the hierarchy of effects to say company-wide communication will work great in terms of educating and informing. But when you start getting down to behavior change, Back to the idea of your reward and recognition programs, they have to be aligned around the behavior you're driving. When you start getting to commitment, participatory learning, um, interactive, engaging learning, which is where you're going to hear gamification is so powerful. Um, if you're going to really get their commitment, it has to be more than one-way communication. It needs to be uh, interactive. And then you move next to the hierarchy of relevance. This is really important because um, if you try to convince employees to adapt a new strategy, a new brand positioning or whatever, and they don't understand how it benefits them, it's hard to get them enrolled. So the hierarchy of relevance says, at the very top, I've got to explain to employees why this is important to the company. Why is this new brand positioning important? Why is this new communication important? Why is this new program important? So that they understand what impact it has on the company. But from there, as an employee, I've got to know, so what's in it for me? You know, what's the benefit to me of this happening? And it isn't always financial. I mean, it may be the stability of your job. It may be the growth of the company. It may be career opportunity. But for an employee to change behavior and fully get engaged, they've got to know how, what's in this for me. How do I benefit from this in addition to the company? And then the last element of that is attribute that says, what do you want me to do differently? So I understand why it's important to the company. I understand what the benefit is to me. What exactly do you want me to do differently? So when we work with clients, we'll lay out a messaging architecture that will take each one of those elements of the hierarchy and look at the messages that a company's trying to deliver. For instance, um, we want to deliver a message of quality. So we'll start with the messaging hierarchy and say, why is that important to the company? Why is quality important to you as an employee? And in many cases, it's simply an issue of pride of working for the company. Um, you remember when the situation went on with AIG, the insurance company? I was talking to somebody about that and they said they actually had a directive when that went on that people could not wear logoed, logoed stuff outside the building. Um, partially because they were afraid, you know, because there was so much animosity towards them. But they weren't really proud to say they worked for that company. So, you know, that, that uh, benefit may simply be an element, are you proud to say you work for HP or do you hide your hat? you know, when you're in public. So that kind of serves as a whole foundation for messaging architecture, and then it doesn't mean anything if you don't tell employees, what do you want me to do differently? And then that last tiered communication says, the tiered communication hierarchy says that, uh, how many of you work for an organization that's got distributed networks or different out offices around the country, national, whatever? Okay. Um, a CEO of a company like that can communicate a message, and it'll have a certain impact. But people look to their immediate leaders and their local leaders for direction. And if that message isn't cascaded all the way down, it'll get lost in translation. So at HP, for instance, when we were about to embark on this unite the company as one brand, um, at the time, our CEO at the time, there were four while I was there, but our CEO at the time, who was Mark Hurd, 
um, told the organization we need to unite as one company. That had a lot of power, but we didn't really start gaining momentum until the managing director of the UK stood in front of his 40 people and said, if you can't be an ambassador for the HP brand, you probably don't need to be here. So it's really powerful to have that message cascade down from the senior levels of the organization to the local leaders. Okay, makes sense? Okay. So now let me get into how, with that as background for the overall process, let me get into how gamification fits into that, and then we'll talk about the mechanics of it. Um, Gallup did a poll recently where they looked at the level of engagement of American workers. Have any of you seen this? Yes. This is really quite alarming because there are a number of studies that will validate the same information that Gallup did, but they came up with 71% of American workers are not engaged today. So only 30% are fully engaged in delivering on the brand promise and executing the business strategy. Now just as scary, at the other end of the continuum, there are about 20 or 30% that are actively disengaged. So they're not only not engaged, they're intentionally trying to sabotage efforts. That's pretty scary. But the good news in that is that means there's this middle group of people that are saying, show me why I should care. You know, um, Theory of change management. If you look at the theory of change management, it's always a bell-shaped curve. There's 10% of the people that will, you'll never convince to come along with you no matter what you say or do. And there's 10% that if you tell them the sky's purple, they'll say, yep, it's purple. They're ready to go. It's the 80% in the middle that are looking for you to convince them where you really need to focus your effort. And oftentimes a company Maybe it's ego, maybe it's determination, but they'll spend an inordinate amount of resources on that 10% they'll never convince. And, and candidly, it's a waste of resources because there's no way you're going to convince them. Or they'll spend a ton of money on the 10% that are absolutely advocates and troopers. I'm not saying ignore them, but they're already in your camp. You know, it's that 80% in the middle that, that are waiting for you to show them why. So that's the good news in this. The bad news is that lack of engagement is costing the U.S. economy about $370 billion annually in lost productivity and lost revenue. So why should I care? This is why you should care. So back to what I started this out with 10, 15, 20 years ago when you talked about this, there wasn't this kind of empirical evidence to sit in front of a CFO or CEO and say, why should I care about engagement? It seems to me that I read a statistic recently, and I apologize that it's going to be real vague, but I saw something recently that high performers were less likely to be engaged than middle or low performers at a company. Do you recall seeing that statistic? I do. Um, I do. And, and there, are, there are a number of, there's another parallel talk about that around satisfaction versus engagement. Um, I, I would just say that without, without, I don't know all the details of it, so without going down, I would tell you this, customer, employee satisfaction and engagement are two different things. Okay. You know, an employee can be completely satisfied but not engaged. So when you look at the 100 best places to work, as you dig into it, you do find out that in some cases, satisfaction and engagement work hand in foot. In others, they don't. I mean, they're happy, they're satisfied, but they're not going to go the extra mile. Could you define the difference between satisfaction and engagement? Satisfaction means they're happy working there. You know, they, they, they're part of the organization, but employee engagement means that you'll expend discretionary effort above and beyond because you truly believe in the vision and mission and strategy. It's more than just being happy that you're working yeah. there. Rick and I, and I, I don't think that's getting better with the economy getting better because I, I, I have clients that are high performers who are saying, I don't really care because if I get, you know, Better offer? I, I'm getting offers every week. Yeah. That's what they're saying. So I think that this engagement isn't, a be, if it's not getting better, would it not be getting better? It's interesting. One of the key statistics that I know HP would measure in its voice of the workforce and a number of other companies would measure as, as well is a simple question that if you were offered a comparable job for comparable pay in another company, would you leave? And it's alarming how many people say, for comparable, I would leave. So, so loyalty is a lot different than engagement. Thank you. Okay. And, and the importance of that is engagement directly translates to how an employee treats a customer. Okay? 
So $370 billion annually. All right, so let's get into gamification and how that plays into this big picture of engagement. Um, remember I showed you this hierarchy of effects of moving employees to a cycle of educating them, seeing the relevance, being committed to changing their behavior, and actually the behavior change. Gamification is one of the only tactics that transcends every phase of that cycle. Gamification can educate, it can inspire, it creates excitement, changes behavior, and recognizes and rewards. So you can bring an employee through that entire cycle with a well-designed gamification program. Um, and it was interesting to me to find out in some of the statistics that the average age of gamers is 37 years old. So, so we're not talking about 19 and 20 year olds that are into this. You know, we're talking about upward 40 years old are people that are really playing games today. How many play words with friends? People won't play with me anymore because I cheat. But, but uh, um, words with friends, Angry Birds, Temple, you know, those kind of games people are engaged in. Uh, I'm going to talk to you in a minute about the difference in that between games and gamification. So this is why gamification is such an important element of overall employee um, engagement plan. So what is gamification? In 2012, Oxford actually added the word gamification to uh, its list of definitions. And here's how they define it. It's the application of concepts and techniques from games to other areas of activity. So it's taking gaming, gaming techniques and putting them into a not-so-game-friendly business environment. It's taking gaming techniques into a non-game-type application. Um, it's a combination of game mechanics and game dynamics. I'm going to share some information with you about motivation. Uh, but gamification takes the fundamental human needs and desires, the things that motivate people, uh, rewards, status, achievement, self-expression, and marries it to the game dynamics of challenges, levels, point accumulation, leaderboards. So it's, it's the actions, behaviors, and controls that actually gamify an activity, that create an engaging experience. Those two things together form gamification. So what is it and what is it not? Um, angry Birds, Temple Run, Words with Friends, that's games. Gamification isn't, isn't just about playing a game with no purpose. It's about engaging users and driving participation to influence their behavior. So gamification are things like Starbucks. How many of you have a Starbucks card? They've done a great job at game. I mean, you get, they tell you you're so close to getting a free cup of coffee. You know, you can go in there and pay for your coffee on your, on your phone. Um, you'll get free rewards on your birthday. They've gamified the whole customer loyalty approach. I'll share a little more with that in just a bit. Um, Foursquare, you know, check into your hot spots. So another gamified approach where you can tell people what your favorite spots are. LinkedIn, how many are on, on LinkedIn? here. Every day they get more and more sophisticated with gamification. Now, they, now they'll show you a little circle that says your profile is 90% complete and you're an all-star. Yeah. You know, or uh, you know, you've got this much more to do to complete your profile. Uh, influencer. influencer. I mean, there's so many different dimensions of it. Um, they'll talk about you know, the connections that you have, how many other people that connects you to. Um, I get emails every day saying, you know, here's some things that you'd really be interested in that are going on in LinkedIn. So they continually expand on their capabilities in gamification. Um, Nike Plus, I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail uh, a little later. Have any of you used the, the little chip? Have you used it? Yeah. Pretty phenomenal engagement, isn't it? So we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but another method of gamification. And then your airline miles and hotel miles, that's all gamification. You know, they'll tell you how many miles you have to earn a free trip. Um, you know, you can redeem miles for things other than airline. You know, they, they've gamified that whole approach. But I'm also going to show you in a minute that that's, that falls short of what they call serious gaming, which is really the pinnacle of gamification, and I'll share that with you in just a minute. But that's what gamification is and, what it, and it's not games. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So... There's a lot of stuff on here you might not be able to read, but let me quickly scan through this. There's a continuum for gamification. This is just what I was talking about in terms of the pinnacle being serious gaming. 
At one end of the spectrum, you've got gainful design. The Twitter fail whale is gainful design. Serves no purpose. You know, it's just a, an icon that pops up and says there's been a failure. Um, and that's all the way at the end of the spectrum, just called gainful design. It's pure entertainment. The next cycle up is games, like the Angry Birds and the Words with Friends and Temple Run. They're games just for pure entertainment. They're just fun to play. They serve no purpose other than just to entertain you. Then you move to the level of gamification, which is what I just described with Starbucks. Um, it uses the elements and techniques that we talked about in a business world to engage users, drive participation, create loyalty, but it's not so much interactive and two-way. It's more of, here's where you're at, the status bar, here's what you need to do to get to the next level. Those kind of things. Serious Games goes one step higher, and I'm gonna share with you the work we did with McDonald's, because that's an example of Serious Games. In Serious Games, the users are actually playing trivia games, they're participating, they're in social communities, talking to others about their achievement, so it's very engaging and very interactive, and it's not just data being sent to them. They're, at, they're sending data and information back up through the system. So I'll share that with you in just a little bit. But that continuum moves from pure entertainment to fun with purpose. That's, again, the difference between games and gamification. So let's talk about, again, why is, why is this becoming such a hot topic? You know, why are so many people starting to talk about gamification and implement it? I want to share some of the stats with you. Um, since 2010, over 350 companies have launched major gamification techniques. Um, not small projects, major projects. In 2010, I mean, we're talking only two or three years ago that this really started to become of age. By 2015, 40% of global 1,000 organizations will use gamification as the primary mechanism to transform their business operations. U.S. companies are going to spend $1.6 billion on gamification by 2015. And then 55% uh, of Americans in a poll said they really would like to work for a company that used gamified techniques. I was talking to somebody earlier about some of the training that, that you might typically look at as being a little more staid and a little not very exciting. So for instance, at HP, we had a standards of business conduct that everybody had to take. Legal made everybody take the standards of business conduct when you join the organization that talked about the wrong and right way to do things. Well, I watched people take that. It was computer-based learning. And virtually, they would do other things on their PC and then click through the program, you know, because they had to say they completed it. The retention level was zero. If I went back to them, you know, a week later and said, what did you learn? It was really just checking the box for training. Companies are starting to realize that if they can transcend that training from something that people enjoy doing, the retention's longer and it's higher to start with. A um, couple other facts. By 2014, 70% of global organizations will have at least one gamified application. By 2015, 50% of organizations that manage innovation processes will gamify them. And today, there's a lot of large companies like Coke, AOL, Nissan, Nike, and Viacom that are already using pretty significant gamified approaches. Walmart and McDonald's, that I'll share with you. Um, and this is really the, the, pay, the ROI. In research, it's been proven that gamification has about a 10 times higher retention rate than traditional computer-based learning or tra training methods. And it's across two dimensions. It's across initial absorption and retention over a period of time. So I, I don't know the exact numbers, but in the initial absorption, gamification is about 20 points higher than traditional training. After two or three years where traditional training might drop to 15% retention, gamification will stay at 60%. So it not only do you absorb more in the start, but you retain the information. That's the payback on why people are focusing. So why does it work? Gamification works because it hits both motivators, your intrinsic and your extrinsic motivators. How many of you have read uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive? Okay, great book about internal motivators. He talks about three things up here, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, those are internal drivers that are innate in all human beings, regardless of what business, 
personal, whatever. We're born with these desires of autonomy, which says we want to control things. We want to be responsible for our future. Mastery, we want to be good at something. You know, whether it's racquetball or golf or business, there's something we want to master. Um, purpose, we want our life to have a meaning and have an impact, and, and we want what we do to have a meaning other than just taking a paycheck. So those three internal motivators drive us in everything we do. Add to that progress, we want to know that we're making progress, that we're advancing, that something's happening. And the social interaction. I mean, you can tell by Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, human beings long to be connected. They want to be part of a community. So gamification works because it takes those internal motivators and marries them to the external motivators of rewards cash awards, recognition, recognition among peers, and, and achievement levels, okay? So why do employees participate? First of all, status, you know, um, titles mean something. You know, how many people, if, if you go and you get your CPA certificate, the first thing you do after your name is put CPA. You know, if you pass the bar exam, it's, it, titles are important, they mean something. They're, they're an indication of achievement. So employees participate because gamification gives them an ability to attain status. Um, recognition and appreciation. And recognition and appreciation that's immediate. Um, I just saw the little book you had on performance evaluations. There's more and more debate that annual performance evaluations just don't seem to cut it. For an employee to go an entire year and then get called into the office and say you did a lousy job. It, it, you know, People want in more instant gratification. They want more instant feedback. Um, gamification gives them that immediate recognition and appreciation. They know if they're doing it right or not. They know if they're being recognized. Early and exclusive access. Um, it's interesting that one of the cheapest things for a company to provide for employees, and yet one of the things that are often guarded the most, is information about what the company stands for and what the vision is. Um, Employees, every survey I've ever seen on what makes employees uh, loyal to a company and feel part of an organization is they want to know what's going on. They want to feel part of the organization. So gamification allows employees to have easy and early access to information. Power, you know, it, it gives you some knowledge as power. And when I share some of the examples of gamification, you'll see the more you equip employees with knowledge, the more power they feel to go out and advocate for your brand and advocate for your company. Um, have, any, have any of you ever given a presentation? I remember somebody asked me if I've done a lot of presentations. Um, being a marketer and an accountant, I've had some really diverse groups. And I can tell you that as a marketer, if I stand and make a presentation in front of accountants, everything I say is true. But when I stand in front of a bunch of marketers, I'm nervous. I mean, you know, they'll know if what I'm saying is invalid or not, right? Power in information. If I know what I'm talking about, I'm much more confident talk, advocating for the brand, advocating for the company. And gamification equips them with information. Community impact incentives. You'll see that it's part of the McDonald's game, for instance, that there's a great opportunity in gamification for people to give back to their communities, to help each other out, to show a benevolence, to, to um, be a part of a community. So those things drive people over why they want to participate in these things. Why do companies use gamification? There's a number of different reasons they would use it. To build a community of fans. So Nike with the running application has built this great community of runners that compare themselves to each other and um, drive in customer engagement and loyalty. When I show you some of the examples, admittedly, I know the title of this is about employee engagement. Admittedly, some of them are more geared towards customer engagement, but I would tell you that customer engagement can't happen without employee engagement. Um, I'll give you a, a brief example of that. When I was running the KitchenAid brand, um, we had a great strategy that we laid out between KitchenAid, Whirlpool, and Roper, where I was running the premium brand, Whirlpool was the middle-of-the-road brand, and Roper was the price brand. We did all this strategizing of, of looking at any new product feature that came out when convection cooking came out. I said, you know, that's a KitchenAid feature. And, and we go through all that strategy and determine price points that were different for each brand. Um, one day a KitchenAid technician was repairing a dishwasher for a customer. 
And a customer asked him why she should buy KitchenAid instead of Whirlpool. And the technician said, I don't know, they come off the same line. <laughs> My strategy was done with that one single touch point. And now if that had happened in today's economy where social media is so prolific, I'd be out of business overnight. Fortunately, that was long enough ago that it took a while for that to travel. But, but it just demonstrated me to the power of not having your employees equipped to represent the brand the way you want it represented. And it isn't just the CEO. It's the customer service rep. It's the person on the phone. It's the gate agent. It's the flight attendant. So uh, driving engagement and loyalty, increasing brand awareness. Um, Foursquare does that by increasing awareness of different locations. And then motivating behavior, motivating behavior with customers as well as employees. So those are the things that why companies would use gamification, and it may be a combination of any of these. So let's talk about gamification mechanics. We've talked about the motivators. Remember at the beginning I showed you there's the motivation and then there's the mechanics. Let's talk about the mechanics a little bit. Um, fast feedback. Again, you, you find out immediately whether you know the information and understand it or not. It's not an annual performance evaluation. Um, transparency. There's transparency with the community that you're involved in and everyone else in terms of how you're doing, what you, you know, how your leaderboards. I'll show you some of those later on. Um, goals. There are very specific goals in, in these that, that are deployed to see short-term and long-term goals. Even in the gamification methods with Starbucks, I know I've got to buy four more cups of coffee before I'm going to get a free one. So the goals is, are all part of the mechanics. Um, badges. Badges will really give them an opportunity to show their recognition. You know, what's interesting to me is a lot of this, I was talking to somebody earlier about leadership. I said, you know, if you go back and read leadership books, all the way back to the beginning of time, there's no new ideas about leadership. If you go search Amazon.com, there's about two and a half million books out there on leadership. Um, gamification is really starting to become of age, but how many of you were in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts? You remember earning the badges, the merit badges? You know, It's not a brand new concept. It was an achievement to be able to put that badge on that I earned that merit badge. So badging is a way to demonstrate achievement. Um, leveling up, the idea of getting to that next level, airline, the airline programs, going from gold status to platinum status, and there are very distinct benefits that go along with that. So leveling up is a big part of mechanics. Um, onboarding, a lot of companies are really looking at gamification for an onboarding perspective. You bring somebody new into an organization, there's a lot for them to learn. They're drinking from a fire hose for the first week. And, and candidly, back to the same thing with standards of business conduct, which was part of HP's onboarding, I mean, it all runs together. And the retention starts to really fade. A lot of companies are looking at these techniques in a fun and inspiring way to teach people about the company, onboard them, teach them about the products. And uh, it becomes a powerful mechanic in terms of orienting somebody to a new environment. Competition. Um, I'm going to talk later on about how important it is that you understand whether competition is part of your culture or not, because it can backfire. But competition is part of the, and healthy competition. You know, healthy competition with your peer group. Collaboration, you know, the fact that you can work together on things, that some of the goals you're trying to accomplish, the communities allow you an opportunity to work together. And not, that's what I mean by healthy competition. Um, the whole idea of a social community, um, I'll show you later on in the pitfall that if there isn't a social element to it, it, it falls a little short of a fully effective gamification because part of the whole motivator is sharing your achievement and sharing your status. And the whole point is the points give you immediate recognition and reward for achievement levels. So when you get that next cup of coffee, you're getting points for that. When you, when you fly in airlines, you get so many points for that. So, these are all the dimensions that go into the actual mechanics of designing a gamification program. <clears throat> okay, so before I get into case studies, questions or does all this make sense to you up to this point? I'm not going to get into depth over the detailed mechanics of it because uh, we could spend another three days doing that. <laughs> but, but I think the idea here is to show, is to make it clear before we get into the case studies that 
gamification is something that really needs to be thought through from a design perspective. And you have to think about the motivators, how you're going to design it, the mechanics, and I'll share some of those tips towards the end of the presentation on how you design a program. So let's look at a couple case studies. All right, so let's talk about Nike, Nike Plus. Um, that whole gamification is all around running. And why was it put in place? It's motivating behavior, it's creating a community of fans, um, and it's driving customer engagement and loyalty. So it started out, they partnered with Apple to provide runners with this fun and easy way to track their progress. So it was a, a chip that went in your shoe, and then you could connect that chip to your computer and download the data and connect it to your iPod. They, they continue to advance the technology on it. But the whole concept was to make it an easy way to track your running and your activity. Um, they built a community of fans around that common interest. You had real-time feedback. I'm going to show you some of the screenshots of some of the data you would get. Um, it tracks your running habits. Frequency of runs analyzes your data by gender and age and geography. And right now, Nike Plus community has more than 10 million users. And this thing was launched in, I think, 2007, 2008. It wasn't that long ago. So, so, so that example was a gamification for customers. Customer yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, some of these are more examples of customers. But again, keep in mind that if employees aren't enrolled and engaged in what's going on here, um, a lot of this stuff could lose some of its focus. But they're great examples of gamification, so even though they're more customer-oriented, I thought I'd share some of those with you as well today. Um, so here's some of the screenshots, some of the data that you would get. Do you recognize any of this data that you would see when you plug it into your PC? I mean, it'll tell you where you ran. It'll give you track, you know, in June and July, how many miles you ran. Um, it tells you how you stack up against your friends. So um, over here, you can see for women your age, how you compare, for your community, how you compare. So it takes all those motivators of gamification and builds them into this program. That achievement, the badges, OK, you, you ran twice, and so you got a twice as nice badge. Um, it has achievement, it has status, it tells you how you're doing with others. There are all these badges down here you can win. Fastest mile, fastest 5K. So it it's, isn't to the area that I share with McDonald's where it's a two-way interactive engaging, real gaming, serious gaming, but it's a very solid gamification approach where you get all those motivators by, uh, in immediate feedback. Starbucks. Gamification of buying coffee, motivating behavior. Again, so back to Angel's point, this is a lot geared towards customer loyalty and engagement. But how many of you have been into a Starbucks? I mean, the baristas, the people behind the counter, it's not the same as going to buy a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, right? It's not just the coffee, it's the experience. So no matter what they did to build this gamification for customers, if when you walked into that store, the experience was poor, it can all fall apart. Just like the KitchenAid thing I shared, if, if the person behind the counter doesn't know that you can use your phone to pay for your coffee. Or uh, my wife has gone in with her card and said, well, it's my birthday. I'm supposed to get a free cup of coffee. Oh, that doesn't show up. You know, so that employee engagement can counter any positive thing you have going on with a customer gamification if they're not enrolled in it and know what you're trying to accomplish. But clearly their motivation was to drive engagement and loyalty. Um, like I said, the loyalty program was to allow customers to pay for their coffee straight from their phone, to take their card. You could go on the internet and auto load your card. So I never have to worry about having money in my pocket when I go to Starbucks. I just have the card. And I know when it gets below $10, they'll reload it. So um, all of those things keep me loyal to going. I mean, candidly, I would tell you, Peach is a big contender for Starbucks, right? But I would tell you oftentimes if I'm taking a client or a friend out for coffee, I'm always going to go to Starbucks because I've got the card I can use. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's driven a level of loyalty. And I also know that if I buy five cups of coffee, it's getting me closer to that next tier. So even though, admittedly, I'm not sure if I could tell you I like Pete's coffee better than Starbucks or vice versa. But I can tell you that I like the Starbucks experience. And so it keeps me going back to Starbucks instead of going to the competitors. 
Um, 4.5 million active members at the end of October 2012. And they're expecting to have 9 million members by the end of fiscal 2013. Um, they transact 3 million mobile activities per week in the U.S. 3 million transactions per week. So here's some of the things you would see in their gamification. On the left side, you can see your card, how you can pay in the store. It tells you the balance on your card. Um, you can see over here the cup, how many stars I have until I get to gold level. So progress, remember all the motivators, I can see progress, I can see, um, and in the middle I can see activity. On Friday the 24th I earned a star from a purchase. Thursday I earned a star from a purchase. I have 17 stars to reach my gold level. So a really sophisticated loyalty program that keeps me coming back to Starbucks instead of one of their competitors. Last uh, example I want to show you is LiveOps. Does anybody know LiveOps? It's like call center, virtual call center. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a different dimension than anything I've showed you so far. Um, it's a provider of cloud-based contact center technology. They use independent agents who have complete authority uh, and a very distributed workforce. So they had a gamification. I don't have any screenshots of any of the mechanics out there, but I'll just show you the results. They had a gamification of their online employee portal. 80% um, of their agents opted into the program. 75% return on a bi-weekly basis. And look at the impact on training. The onboarding process dropped from four weeks of classroom training to four, four hour, 14 hours by implementing a gamified approach. 10% improvement in service levels. So remember that connection between the customer loyalty and the employee engagement. 15% um, reduction in the average time to handle a customer inquiry, and an 8 to 12% improvement in sales performance. The same content of training delivered in a fun and engaging way instead of a traditional computer-based learning or classroom training. So a uh, really powerful demonstration of the impact a good gamification program can have. Okay? So, um, now I want to go into some of the tips in building a gamification program, some of the pitfalls to avoid. Uh, so before I do that, any questions on any of the case study stuff or? I'm yeah. going to talk to um, the time limitations. So for Nike and for Starbucks, you want people to be engaged pretty much all the time, whereas as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Versus the other two actually uh, within companies. So if you have both hourly and salary employees, you know, how do you keep it so that you know, a, a salary employee who can do their work from you know nine to eleven o'clock at night or whatever they want to, you know, versus an hourly employee, you really want them to do that on the clock. And how do you kind of manage that time? Can you talk to that in terms of the tips and tricks? Okay, great, great point. Um, I'll show you in some of the tips for setting up a program. And that's one of the parameters you have to define up front. Okay. So, for instance, with the Walmart program. Mm -hmm. um, they were concerned about that. I mean, we've got people taking care of customers on the floor. I can't have somebody play the game all day, right? Exactly. So they set the program up to say they can only answer three questions a day. Okay. After three questions, they're locked out until the next day. And that holds true for any association? That holds true for that group. Now, they may do something different for some salary employees. Okay. But it really is in the design. But the leaderboard's going to be different. It's going to have to change at that point as well. That's right. Okay. So it really is how you, you can. There's so many variables to how you can design it. And when I share the tips, one of the key things is that design up front. You know, I was just saying, I don't know if this was actually the indication that was going on, but I called the call center mm -hmm. and I was talking to the gentleman and all of a sudden I hear this, yeah, popping and cheering. And I go, what is going on? And he said, oh ma'am, one of our, um, people in the call center just got a really good feedback. So, you know, when you call the call center, they send you a, an online, can you, uh, um, can you give us feedback on your yes. performance? So somehow or another, they gamified that whole process that goes back, by the way, immediately to the person who, who gets the yeah, feedback absolutely. now. Now, whether there's point, other point systems, I don't know, but it was, it was interesting to yeah. see how they did that. That's great. Well, have any of you ever been on an airline where they give you, a, you know, you can write a card out that says this flight attendant did an exceptional job? Those are all forms of gamification. What I would tell you when I talk to you about the pitfalls is one of the problems is 
Sometimes a company will throw out something like that without being designed as part of an overall program. And it'll, it'll die on the vine pretty quickly. El Camino Hospital has the same thing, where they, um, you go in and you fill out a little form, and mm -hmm. that form has a little star associated with the person you gave feedback to. Yes. And they have a board that's mm -hmm. exposed to everyone, and you could see all the stars or whatever yeah, feedback absolutely. that they've gotten, which is, you know, they, they wait for those stars to increase. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, my, my question is also uh, along the lines of hers uh, with regard to the practicality of how you actually implement gamification. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, four of the five largest uh, truck fleets, Pepsi, Coke, FedEx, UPS, mm -hmm. they're all outside, they're all you know out and about. A cable installer, or a, a repair technician, they're all outside. So mm -hmm. it looks like this is very driven from a computer. So how, how do you mesh somebody who's in a truck all the time as opposed to, I mean, how, how does that work? Uh, mobility has added great yeah. potential to do it all. Can you do it? You have it on your phone? I'm tracking, oh, yeah. tracking their time. Yeah, I mean, everyone is the number of people that use both mobile devices, you know, whatever, gives you the ability to reach people that you normally wouldn't unless they're sitting in a PC. But I would tell you, gamification uh, doesn't necessarily have to be technologically driven. I mean, it's easier that way. Okay. But you can develop a gamification program that, that doesn't have to depend on your technology. Is there generic software for gamification? Uh, there are a number of companies out there that specialize, companies like Bunchball, like Badgeville, that uh, have developed platforms okay. for gamification. So, Rick, uh, I spoke to you earlier on yes. the innovation games company, yes. right? So There's no generic answer to it. It depends on what you're building. But I would tell you, I, I would condition what you said. I think a lot of times someone can be at a company 10 years and still not be knowledgeable mm -hmm. enough to be an, totally. a brand advocate wow. or not be passionate enough to do it. Uh, an example, at HP, one of the first things that I did, because I was driving internal brand alignment and employee engagement, my, my role was to take 350,000 people in 170 countries and get them rallied around one vision and to take all the global functions and get them aligned so the employee experience was the same. So one of the first things I did, I went through the hallway and asked people, what are HP's values? It was amazing to me how many people couldn't tell me the values of the company. I would get answers like, well, I know where to find them, but that's not good enough. I mean, if they're not the part, you know, then, then it's no good. But, and these weren't people who just started a year ago. There were people that have been there 20 years that couldn't tell me. Or I, you know, um, People, this is what really started the initiative at HP. The CEO was meeting with a potential customer, 
and he had four salespeople in the office with him. One introduced himself as Legacy HP, one said I'm Contact, one said I'm EDS, one said, you know, and the customer said, aren't you all the same company? The reality is we found out through that that tenured employees had no idea of the total scope of HP's offering. So I think sometimes it's dangerous to assume that tenure means knowledge. Yeah, totally. Um, yes? Uh, to give a technical answer to her question, um, my Again, I'm going to show you in design, who does it is not as important as the fact that it gets done. Yeah. So in an effective gamification. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I came in a little late. I don't know if you covered this, but you know, I know this is uh, rolled out to employees. Um, I think you mentioned this is also open to the customers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a question in terms of, um, which I think is a great idea, in terms of like how do you maintain the security? I mean, do you share the same information? I mean, I would think you want to share maybe a little less with your customers versus your uh, yet another point that I'm going to share with okay. you about getting, about getting legal involved in what you share and what you don't. Okay. Thank you. So all, all these th these are all great questions. There's no definitive answer to say here's what you do as much as when you design a gamification, they're all things you have to consider given the company you're dealing with, given the culture of that company, and I'll share that with you in just a minute. Okay? One on effectiveness of uh, engaging employees. Is there any effects by generations or in the work group? Um, no, what's interesting is what I said earlier is that the average age of the gamer is 37 years old. Millennials obviously almost expect in a digital age, they expect learning to be more engaging. Mm -hmm. But you're seeing that 40 years, I mean, I won't tell you my age. I would tell you that, that I'm a little more than 40. And, and still, if I'm going to learn something, I'm going to get much more engaged if I'm enjoying the learning. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's no, uh, do, do you need any type of a special incentive for different types of employees, or do you find that they all accept this type of engagement? When you look at the motivators for why they participate, you don't need any special incentives. Okay? All right, so I want to make sure, how much more, I, yeah, I want to make sure I get to okay. these last couple slides. So what are the benefits of gamification? It improves now. I'm going to go through this quickly because I don't have that much time and I want to make sure I answer your questions about designing. Um, it improves knowledge, obviously. It gives employees the power to actively gauge their performance. A lot of this is kind of a recap of everything I've talked about already. It boosts achievement across the board. Builds higher levels of engagement in that whole charitable connection point. And it emphasizes learning and development. It, it doesn't have to replace learning and development programs that are in place now. It can supplement. It builds on your current learning and development. Okay, so considerations for introducing gamification. Um, you've got to know who your audience is. McDonald's could build this great gamification because they have a competitive culture. If you don't have a competitive culture, it could be a problem. You've got to think about how you design this. So you've got to know what motivates them, what drives them. Uh, back to your question, I mean, how, why are they going to be engaging them? What's going to make them want to engage? It's knowing who you're designing it for. Um, Angel mentioned at the beginning that I did leadership training before. One of the things we tried to teach leaders is you've got to know your people. You've got to know what motivates and inspires them, or you'll never engage them. Um, and a lot of times, leaders look at it through their own perspective. I'll give you a quick example of that. When I was a a controller in cable television, I had a young accountant that wasn't doing real well, and I said, you know, if you don't straighten up your act, you're never going to be controller. And the person said, I don't want to be controller. Now what do I do? <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't take the time to understand what was important to that person, and it wasn't for you to see a CFO. So you've got to know your audience when you design this, what you're designing. Um, you've got to know what you're trying to accomplish. Remember, gamification is fun with purpose. It's not just pure entertainment. So know what you're trying to accomplish. What kind of technology are you going to use? Back to the idea of using mobile technology, you know, P 
PC? What, what kind of technology platform are you going to use something in-house? Are you going to have it hosted externally? You've got to think about the technological implications. What kind of awards and recognitions are you going to use? What's important back to knowing that audience? Is it uh, collateral material for the company? Is it things outside the company? Is it money? Is it badges? What are you going to use to recognize? Um, the game mechanics, we could go into all kinds of detail on this, you know, again, game mechanics, uh, how are you going to design this thing, what are the leveling up, you know, all the things that I shared with you earlier, um, that how are you going to design the actual game application, how are you going to measure success, what's your, what's your ROI, what's your KPIs that you're going to look at, that are going to say whether this was worth the investment. There's always going to be a CFO or a CEO that's going to say this is great, what, what impact did it have? So you have to determine up front how you're going to measure the success of this. Is it going to be by sales, increased sales? Is it going to be increased employee satisfaction, increased customer satisfaction? What are your metrics? Common fit, pitfalls. If you forget that motivation is everything. Th these are the reasons that something will fall apart. 80% of gamification uh, initiatives will fail because they're poorly designed. Um, trying to tack on gamification, just trying to throw out, well, let's just recognize somebody, but it's not part of a design. It's not understanding who your audience is, what you're trying to accomplish, how it fits into overall employee engagement plan. So um, if somebody just throws out a leaderboard, you know, it's probably not going to sustain the test of time without having a design for it. Not getting senior alignment. When you talk to some senior leaders about gamification, they immediately think of games. And back to your question over here, I don't want my people playing games. They're supposed to be working. Um, you've got to make sure they understand that this is entertaining with a purpose, what you're trying to accomplish. Not giving people access to share their success. Um, that's why the social community is such a critical part of this. I mean, achievement only matters if I could share it with somebody else. So it's important that the social community is connected. And then another question that came up, it can't get predictable and have outdated content. Somebody has got to be responsible for keeping it active. Um, one of the things I'll show you in a minute is if, if you don't have a way, what if somebody gets stuck? You know, uh, there's, there's a game out there, the Candyland, that I'm playing. I got to a certain level and I'm stuck. So now what happens? I put it away. I'm done. I, I don't know how to get unstuck. So you've got to think about not making it outdated and keeping it current and keeping it active. So let's talk about two more slides. Let's talk about 12 must-haves to succeed with gamification. Um, you've got to have a solid gamification strategy. And a lot of this is summary of everything we've talked about. But there has to be a solid strategy, not just throwing up a leaderboard. Um, somebody has to own the project. And this goes back to some of your questions you have. Someone has to be responsible for developing it and owning the content and making sure that it's right. There, you have to look at the collaboration. Um, if, if you're trying to create a consistent employee experience, again, HR, marketing, communications, learning and development, whoever needs to be involved in designing the game and activating, you've got to make sure that collaboration is done up front. Um, leadership buy-in, I've already talked about. If you don't have leadership buy-in, um, it probably won't sustain because it will be perceived as pure gaming for entertainment. Field testing. Um, important to test this before you roll it out to the masses and make sure that all the bugs are worked out. Um, legal approval, the issue earlier, you know, when you're sharing information, legal is going to definitely want to get involved to make sure that you're not sharing things you shouldn't be sharing, employees or customers. So you have to cross that tick mark. Um, weekly update means it's important that when you're designing this that you're consistently getting together with the right people and making sure that things on track and you're designing it according to specifications. Um, task accountability, who's doing what. Launch the communication plan. They can't play if they don't know about it. So you've got to have a comprehensive communication plan explaining to employees what you're trying to accomplish, how they play the game, how they engage in it, how they earn points. So that's important to develop that. A beta test. Test it to make sure all the bugs are out. Um, Schedule for enhancements and updates. Make sure that there's a routine where you're going to make sure that the content's current, content's updated. And then finally, uh, post-launch field testing and assessment. 
know, it's, it's a continuous flow of making sure that you're testing how it's working and doing assessment. Um, last thing, five rules for bringing the gamification into your company. Repeat, get executive buy-in and make it count. Explain the rules of the game. They have to know how to play. Create a master communication plan. Make sure that you're explaining what the intent of the game is and what you're trying to accomplish. Reward employees who spread the word, like McDonald's did. Here's 25 points for connecting someone else to the game. And ask for feedback and do something with it. Uh, a lot of companies that do an annual employee survey, it comes back to bite them because you ask employees what they think and then you don't do anything with it. So you've got to make sure that if you ask for feedback, even if it's we're not going to implement that, it's important to close the loop and get back to uh, employees when you get feedback. So that's it. Um, if anybody would like to learn more about gamification or employee engagement, the contact information is up here. Um, and uh, any questions about any of the specific case studies we've had or how you design a program, we'd be glad to help you. And uh, as a way of gamification of ending, if anybody gives me their business card, I'll send them the presentation short of McDonald's. <laughs> okay, I can't give you McDonald's, but I'll send you the presentation. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Before everyone heads out, it's just a couple of uh, information things. Uh, first, like Rick, um, like I said, bring him a business card. He'll get you some information. If you're an ASTD Golden Gate Chapter member, we're going to ask Rick to clean out the McDonald's stuff out of there that you can't share because of the non-disclosure agreement. And we post all of our information on the website, and members get access to it for free. Thanks to Troy. Troy videotaped uh, the, the event here today, and we're establishing the Golden Gate Chapter YouTube channel. So be watching for that to come up and even, even watch from there. So Troy, thanks for uh, doing that as well. So there's a number of benefits to uh, being with the chapter. One of the things that we also want to thank um, Rick about today is all our chapter events cannot be free. It costs to do some of these things. It's free today because Inward funded it. So thank, thank you for your donation. <laughs> county of uh, the leadership and the training department here for letting us use this facility. It helps keep our costs down. It's a wonderful facility to do that. So thank you. Again. So as you leave, a couple of things. We ask you to keep your name tag. The reason is on the front is your name, and we hope you know that. But on the back are the next four ASTD events. So if you want a little takeaway of well, what's going on. But we do like the uh, holder back. Then there's a brown thing to put their holder back. The, um, there's a slip on your table, some feedback for tonight. We're interested on how we can serve you better. The important thing about geographic interest groups, we are here to serve the South Bay community and say, what do you want to have covered? It's also an opportunity to say, hey, I've got a couple hours a month, I'm willing to volunteer, help with some administrative things or whatever. And you can just drop that in the uh, brown uh, bucket back there where you'll drop your name tag over. Or you can talk to Veronica if you have something on your mind right away, and uh, she will get that information from you. Rick sponsored tonight, so we thank you for that. Another one of our sponsors this year has been the University of Wisconsin Distance Learning and Teaching Conference. I'm going for the 16th consecutive year in a couple of weeks. Um, there's some brochures in the back. The early registration date is July 22nd. If you are involved in any type of e-learning or mobile learning and you want to learn how gamification is being used in the education industry, higher ed, the military and government, great place to go. That's back there. And finally, if you didn't pick up one of our handouts, Rick referred a couple of times to, well, there's design issues, there's design issues. I wish we could say it was the wonderful foresight of the leadership team here. It is not. It is pure luck. Trish Yule, who is a Chicagoland ASTD member, happens to be in San Jose for another event and called us last week and said, hey, is there anything I can do for your chapter? I said, well, what do you do? And she said, blah, 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 blah. And then she said, and I do gamification for instructional designers. <laughs> and we said, really, when can you be here? So it's going to be August 6th right here. And part of her presentation is if you bring a laptop, an iPad, or some sort of device, you will build a game in the session and be able to walk out with that skill. So if you're interested in that, uh, please take it. Final pitches, there's fruit, there's cookies, uh, there's water. Uh, please don't make us carry it out. Uh, I can't afford six more cookies tonight. So uh, please take whatever you'd like, and thank you all for being here.